the 80s harmful effects they have on human and environmental health. As for the effects on raptors, organic warnings have been known to cause reproductive issues and developmental defects, including embryo mortality, deformities, eggshell thinning, and edema, as well as neurological dysfunction and motor skill impairment. As apex predators, raptors die of magnified contaminants, putting them at a substantially greater risk of these compounds. These complications can drastically impact the raptor's ability to survive in the wild and reproduce which is evident in the historical decline in raptor species, which are a direct result of organic warnings. An example of this is the 1975 New Jersey ostrich population, which was about 66 pairs, which starkly contrasts the historic population of 350 to 450 pairs. Following the ban, levels have decreased and raptor populations have steadily recovered. Raptors provide valuable ecosystem services, including disease control and waste removal. And an example of this is that declines in vultures could cause more exchange between mammalian scavengers at carcasses, which facilitates disease transmission. Raptors are able to quickly respond by their ability to fly. In addition, while flying throughout their home range, raptors transport nutrients from one to another, both terrestrial and aquatic systems, which is vital for plant growth in areas with limited nutrients. As apex predators, raptors are especially useful to study to determine ecosystem health as they act as bioindicators of environmental conditions that can also impact humans. And an example of this is the canary in the coal mine. The Carolina Raptor Center is a nonprofit raptor rehabilitation facility located in the East Charlotte region. And despite the general trend of organic learning residues decreasing in the environment, since 2016, they have received raptors with neurological dysfunction, which is a sign of disease and spinal injury, but also of pesticide toxicity. And these raptors died regardless of treatment within 24 hours of arrival. Following extensive investigation, some of these fatalities appear to be caused by extremely high levels of organic chlorine. Provided by the Carolina Raptor Center, between 2016 and 2018, tissues from 41 birds with neurological symptoms were sent off for chemical analysis. Of these birds, seven were found to have extremely high organic chlorine residues in either their liver or brain tissue. One red shoulder hawk was found to have 59.2 parts per million of dialgin and 6.2 parts per million of heptachlor oxycordane in its brain. For reference, the lethal thresholds of these compounds are 4 parts per million of dialgin and 5 parts per million of heptachlor oxycordane in the brain. Another example is a red shoulder hawk that was found to have 705 parts per million of dialgin in its liver. And it is important to note that this is a liver sample, so it can't be compared to the lethal threshold for the brain, but it is extremely concerning nonetheless. As for potential hypotheses, one goal of this study was to determine if exposure is limited to migratory raptors. This is because if it is limited to potentially migratory raptors, they could have been coming into contact with organic organs in certain countries in South America that have not yet all of the brain. This could happen by then storing the organic organs in their fats and then actually metabolizing it and flying back to the US, which could be why they're presenting in the US. If this issue is not limited to migratory raptors, this could be an issue of purposeful poisoning or illegal use of organic organs. And one thing to note is that I will be referring to these raptors as either potentially migratory or non-migratory, because although potentially migratory is due to best the ability to migrate, not all choose to do so, so we have no way of knowing for sure whether they did migrate or not. And another thing to note is that there could be other hypotheses. These are just the ones that we determined to be the most likely. Raptors were acquired from the Carolina Raptor Center. We collected 40 liver and brain tissue samples from 27 raptors. 
These raptors were not selected based on cause of death or symptomology, as one goal of the study was to determine how widespread this issue is outside of just those presenting with symptoms. For example, the cause of death might have been determined to be hit by a car. That raptor could have been hit by a car because it was flying abnormally due to organic lung exposure. So that is why we decided to choose them non-specific to cause of death. 24 potentially migratory raptor tissues were collected and 16 non-migratory tissue samples. And as you can see in this graph, you can see the species, whether they are potentially migratory or not, as well as the quantity of tissue samples collected. And I'll go down the list to explain the acronyms. So BDOW is barred owl, BLVU is black vulture, COHA is Cooper's hawk, THOW is great horned owl, OSCR is osprey, RSHA is red shouldered hawk, and RTHA is red tailed hawk. As for the experimental procedure, each of the selected raptors was dissected by performing necropsies in order to access their liver and brain tissues. Tissue samples were homogenized and dehydrated using a mortar and pestle followed by sodium sulfate. Non-target compounds were removed using a catcher's kit, which stands for quick, easy, cheap, effective, rugged, and safe. And it is just that. It is an extremely effective method at cleaning up samples. Following this, samples were sent to the Mississippi State Chemical Lab, where a GCMS, or gas chromatography mass spectrometry instrument, was used in order to verify and quantify organic chlorine residues. And 17 organic chlorine pesticides and metabolites were targeted for analysis. To assess our extraction methods, we first analyzed three blank chicken liver samples by putting PCMX VCUP in them. And this is essentially a spiking solution. And we put this in so that we can make sure that you're getting all of it out that you're putting in. So we put this into every sample to assess our recovery rate so that we can essentially tell that if we are getting the exact amount of PCMX BCDP that we put in on any given sample, then we make the assumption that we are also getting the right amount out of the actual pesticides that are targeted for analysis. Acceptable recovery rates are within 80 to 120 percent. So as you can see, our recovery rates fall well within that range. We statistically compared the mean values of each organic chlorine pesticide using one direction to the t-test, analyzing concentrations of liver and brain samples separately. A correlation between brain and liver tissue concentrations was determined using the correlation coefficient. Five out of 17 organic brain compounds were detected. However, the only organic brain consistently detected was 4,4-DDE, which is a breakdown product of DDT. So this is the part of the compound that we chose to run analyses on. 11 raptors were included to determine the relationship between liver and brain samples. Liver and brain tissues are significantly positively correlated in regards to the concentrations of 4,4-DDE. And as you can see in the graph with liver on the x-axis and brain on the y-axis, they have a positive and linear correlation. This graph for the liver concentrations of 4,4-DDE included 14 potentially migratory and 12 non-migratory tissues. No significant relationship or difference was observed between liver concentrations of 4,4-DDE between potentially migratory and non-migratory raptors. As you can see, the mean for potentially migratory raptors was 0.755 micrograms per gram, whereas for non-migratory raptors, the mean was 0.645 micrograms per gram. As you can see with potentially migratory raptors on the left and non-migratory on the right, there was one outlier in the data set for potentially migratory raptors. However, overall, there were no significant differences. This 
staff for brain concentrations of 44 DDE included eight potential migratory raptors and four non migratory raptors. Following the same trend of liver, no significant relationship or difference was observed between brain concentrations of 44 DDE between potential migratory and non migratory raptors. As you can see, the mean for potentially migratory raptors was 0.0116 micrograms per gram. And for non migratory raptors, the mean was 0.016 micrograms per gram. As seen on the left, potentially migratory and on the right, non migratory raptors, potentially migratory raptors did have an outlier, but there was no significant difference. As for the results, there is a significant positive correlation between liver and brain concentration. This is extremely useful to know because liver is more commonly sampled. However, the existing lethal thresholds are for the brain. There is limited data on lethal thresholds in the liver. Therefore, future studies with a larger sample size and more diverse sample pool could examine whether liver levels could be used to predict brain levels, which could then determine exposure significance. As for potentially migratory versus non migratory, organic brain exposure does not appear to be a widespread issue that raptor species face, as tissues were selected at random and non specific to cause of death or symptoms. And no statistically significant patterns were identified. Relatively low levels were detected regardless of migration patterns. And although steadily declining, 44 DDE is shown to be the most abundant and persistent organic learning, which is likely the reason why it is most consistently detected throughout these tissue samples. As for implications to the Carolina Raptor Center, these findings are valuable to make sense of the seven raptors that they received with extremely high concentrations in their liver and brain. This does not appear to be a common issue anymore as supported by current research as well as my findings. Because of this, the source of the extremely high concentrations could be local and an incident of purposeful poisoning due to the unreasonably and inexplicably high levels and because no correlation was found between migratory raptors. Purposeful poisoning of raptors, which is most often done by farmers to stop them from preying upon livestock, is a relatively common occurrence, although rarely documented and acknowledged. Therefore, it is a viable possibility. Insecticides, including organic lines, are among the most frequently involved in pesticides in cases of animal poisoning. However, much more extensive research and investigation would be needed to confirm the possibility of deliberate poisoning. It is important to note that contamination could be due to a combination of various sources mentioned or those not yet identified. We can, however, likely rule out foreign countries that have not yet banned organic learning as the sole contamination source, as organic learning toxicity is not limited to potentially migratory raptors. Future studies should be conducted with a larger sample size to determine the extent of the organic learning issue, as well as the relationship between liver and brain lethal thresholds. Additionally, we should study concentrations in doctors exhibiting symptoms of insecticide toxicity prior to death to see whether it was likely the cause of death and to gauge the level of exposure. You should also look at the current most commonly used pesticides that are still legal to determine exposure and impact on raptors. Organic lines have devastated raptor populations, therefore the proactive monitoring of these compounds is necessary to protect them and continue the trend of the decrease in residues in the environment. Here is my work cited. And thank you for listening and learning more about my research. And I would like to reiterate how vital the Mecklenburg Audubon Society funding was to complete this research. And I am truly so honored to have been awarded. And now, does anyone have any questions for me? Are you out there? That's the question. <laughs> Is she there? Alina? Alina? Unmute yourself. Oh, hi. To 
There she is. Yay! <laughs> it took me a little while to get into the meeting. <laughs> so, do you want to? Uh, uh, does anybody have any questions? Um, David, can you see if there are any questions online? Um, do you have any other? Yeah, um, David. Got a lot of David's here. Go ahead. Potential for purposeful poisoning of rats by uh, farm, farmers. What would a rat have to prey on? Okay. Okay. So the question is, um, if there's purposeful uh, poisoning on a part of farmers, what are they? What are they poisoning, or how how is the raptor getting those poisons? Yeah, so typically, no, that's a great question. Um, typically, what we see is, you know, not that they're putting out organic chlorine pesticides, but they're more so um, injecting, let's say, rats or whatever else with organic chlorine pesticides, and then the raptors will go and eat, you know, those rats or mice or whatever the um, animal is. So they'll ingest it that way. So when they're hunting um, on the land, then they'll end up um, consuming an animal that has, you know, also been exposed to organic chlorine pesticides. Is that good? So, Judy, a follow-up question, I guess. This is going to be a follow-up question. Let me hear it first. It's the intent of the rat to mice or the intent to kill the raptor? Okay, so is the intent to kill the rats and mice, or is the intent actually to kill the raptor? Do you think? Yes. So the intent is actually to kill the raptor. Um, that being said, you know, raptors are um, not very easy to get close to. Um, so they'll typically only come around humans or those areas for um, the purpose of preying on different animals. Um, so that is why they typically will, you know, put it into an animal that they prey upon. Um, so they, the intent is for the raptors because the raptors um, will go for chickens, for example, or other animals um, from, from farms. <laughs> uh, but that is a method that they typically do use um, to, to poison raptors, um, as well as other- Would um, you laugh? Uh-huh. Repeat that last piece because you, you froze up on us. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah, so that, um, so the intent definitely is the raptors. Um, but that is typically the method that they go about it. Um, as well as for other animals that could be preying upon their animals as well. Um, so they do use that as a method for, um, a variety of animals, but in this area, raptors are one of the main, um, birds of prey or, or animals of prey in this, you know, area. Oh, there you go. Are you okay? Are you still there? Okay. Um, we got a question from uh, folks out in cyberspace somewhere. Uh, says great. Uh, Susan, uh, Sarah says great job. I'm wondering which e illegal pesticides might be the next most interesting ones. I don't know whether interesting might be the word, but the the biggest problem. Do you have any idea? Um, yeah, so there definitely are some pesticides that are being used um, nowadays more often since the ban. Um, that being said, I'm not sure of the exact um, compound names, but there definitely are some pesticides that have, in a way, replaced um, organic chlorines. Um, you know, since then, that we may find out in the coming years are just as harmful, um, if not more harmful. So I think that would be really, really useful to look into specific to the raptor population and um, to see how these pesticides that are now more commonly used um, are, are affecting them. I have another question from cyberspace. Other than the intentional poisonings, could the high levels uh, you detected from uh, be from legacy pesticide use, meaning leftovers from DDT or whatever other um, pesticides are being used? Yeah, so that is a great question. Um, so we do not believe so. And that's because if you look at the environmental levels um, in general in the, in, in the states, but also in this area, the residues in the environment are actually very, very low. Um, so it is very unlikely that it is, you know, a legacy exposure. Um, and because those levels were, you know, few and far between, but so extremely high, um, the almost the only 
explanation would be a purposeful poisoning because they were so extremely high. Um, and those levels just don't exist in the environment anymore, luckily. Um, so we do believe that purposeful poisoning is the the only justification that we have as of now, but we um, we are, you know, searching for different ideas that it could be, but we don't believe, um, you know, that legacy could be the cause of this. Okay, any other questions? Okay, oh, I got one behind us, Rayo, what's up? So is there a uh, resource that the average reward can go to to see a list of uh, pesticides that we should stay away from for treating on orders? Um, she may not know this one. <laughs> Do you know if there's a list of um, that homeowners could go to that would tell us what have these bad um, pesticides? Um, I'm not sure if <laughs> um, I'm not sure of an exact resource, but that being said, I can definitely look into that and send one over. Um, I know that I did find a few different resources that were similar when I was researching um, for this project, so I can definitely send some of that over. Um, there are a few, you know, commonly used um, pesticides today for that people typically use in their gardens or on their lawns um, that we do know to be harmful. So I can send that over. That'd be appreciated and I'll send it out um, to the okay. list and membership. Uh, Len. Uh, during your research, did you come across other students at universities or other research we've done in this kind of same subject area? Okay, so he wants to know if there's other, um, there other research out there or if you came across some of that research uh, when doing this on the same topic or a very similar topic? Um, yeah, so I didn't find, um, there There are no other students at university that were working on this project. Um, and I it, that in part is because raptors are, as they are federally protected, it is pretty difficult to get your hands on um, you know, any any raptors um, bodies to, to perform this research on. Um, I was volunteering for the Carolina Raptor Center at the time, so that is how I was able to, to gain access to um, those previous patients. That being said, yeah, it is, it is pretty hard to do this type of research um, unless you are volunteering for a similar organization. Um, I know, though, that there are several projects going on in other states or other parts of the world, especially in countries that still have not banned organochlorines. Um, but within the, the U.S., um, because it's banned, many people aren't currently researching this, um, even though there are a few, you know, few and far between, but a few very high levels. Anything else? Any other questions, comments? We want to thank you, and I'm so glad we finally got, got good stuff. I'm sorry about the confusion. Oh, no problem at all. Yeah, I'm very happy I could be here. I'm sure you're used to that with all your classes that have been online, right? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, you're welcome to stay on and see what we what's coming up next. Um, um I got to do two things at once here. Hold on. <laughs> uh, rid of this. Come on, go away. <laughs> Okay, we're going to do the um, or the uh, slides or the photo share now. Um, those are people that are here that will talk. Um, there, are, I hope the rest of you are online somewhere. <laughs> I know Betty's out there. Uh, I'm not sure who else is, but when you see your name, <laughs> you need to come up here. You don't necessarily have to stand in front of the camera, but stand at least next to the mic. So that they, so that you can be heard, um, not only by the people in the room, but also by um, the folks um, online. Uh, okay, so give me uh, John Hanna is the next first one up. So let me get everything pulled up. Ready? Now just stand there. There you don't have to be right on top. Hi, my name is John Hanna. 
my wife and I, Chris, took about four weeks over October and November, went to South Africa. Uh, since we hadn't done anything with the money over the last three years of COVID, we decided to take a long trip. Uh, we managed to find about 460 species of birds, 174 which were new for us. Oops, sorry, sorry, my bad. And these aren't necessarily my best photos, but I had 4,000 photos, so I jumped on the first six I thought were interesting. <laughs> this fellow is, is a crested barbet, and the only good picture I can get of him was on the ground because in the trees they hid. So, and that was in Mapan Gubwe National Park in northern South Africa. My favorite bird is the lilac breasted roller, and this was taken at Shingwedzu Camp in Kruger National Park. This is a common bulbul, and it was found at Susulu National Botanical Garden. This is a fiery necked nightjar found at Tembe Elephant Park. I have two questions. Yeah. Why is this called fiery? Next. Neck? Yeah. Allegedly, I guess that roof is around his neck is Don't look at by some people considered to be fiery. <laughs> <laughs> Never seen a night jar that looked fiery. Fiery neck, yeah. This is a Dederic <laughs> cuckoo. <laughs> It was found in Tembe Elephant Park also. And this is a saddle bill stork found in Cougar National Park and uh, at the Lataba River Bridge Overlook. And that's my favorite six. All right. Okay, Betty, are you out? Betty. Betty, unmute yourself. I know she's there. I am there. I'm here. <laughs> All right. Okay, I've got my six, and they're just uh, pretty random. They're just some pictures that I thought I enjoy looking at, and I thought maybe you all would too. Um, this is the ruby-throated hummingbird looking outside my office window. They get a little more com uh, comfortable out there after a while. This is, hold on, <laughs> after a while. So he sat there for a while. Let me take his picture. I always think he looks like uh, uh, he's got a tuxedo on there with a bow tie. But anyway, that's the ruby throated. The next is. Hi. How's that? Went to Huntington Beach State Park in October with the Mecklenburg Audubon and got to see this black crown night heron. He was all in a bush and I couldn't get much picture of him, but I could get his eye. So there's my photograph. The next. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Janet Palmer um, gave a bird walk at Wing Haven, and we encountered this very personable Eastern Phoebe who landed on her hat and landed on people's cell phones and their hands and various parts. He was just very, very, I think this is a very fun picture. And I liked it. I got him with Janet too. Next picture. I got to see a Rufus or Allen's hummingbird in Freedom Park in November. The bird just kind of flew up to me. I was so startled to see a hummingbird in November, but I actually got a picture of him too. Richard Bocat also had a really outstanding photograph, but this is the one I took. Next. Okay. That's my one of my female Baltimore Oriole outside of my again outside of my office window. Didn't have to go far to get these pictures. Um, she's become a regular. I, um, Jeff Turner came over and took some pictures of her too. This I think is the same one. I can't always tell, but um, it's it's fun to have them here. I didn't even know they were in the neighborhood until last year, and I put out grape jelly, and they started coming. And then comes my last picture. This is a red-shouldered hawk that I saw on Bowen Creek Greenway in Chapel Hill. 
was keeping company with some tur tur turkey vultures that were taking care of a, uh, a deer carcass, but this one let me get pretty close and I, I like the glint in his eye. Anyway, those are my six photographs. I hope you enjoy seeing them. Thank you very much. It, Bud, are you out there? I'm not here. Just trying to get myself are you here? I'm, I'm get myself okay, okay, unmute yourself, Bud. Okay. Say something to us. Can you hear? Judy, can you hear me? Are you talking to us? Hold on. Oh, I hear, I hear, I barely hear him. How about that? Any better? A little, a little closer. Get a little closer to your yeah. mic. Still too low. Can you hear me? Not really. I mean, I can hear you, but the rest of the room can. What? Oh okay, yeah, I can repeat that. <laughs> Don't you love technology? <laughs> Try it again. Talk to us. Talk to us. But are you there? About now. Uh, not really. Any better? No. Nope. Just yell. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Go ahead and show the first slide, please. I'm getting it. There we go. All right. This this is absolutely the best bird photograph ever taken <laughs> this is my granddaughter emmeline on her third birthday who got a junior bird watching kit and she's helping me she got her first life bird that day which was a uh, house house finch and i asked her how many birds she saw and she said she see she saw four grandpa and this picture and her biography was published in the ABA magazine in December of this year. Okay. Next picture, please. This was the first, by the way, for those, a little bit of background, 2022 was my first full year of birding. So on my first guided walk, where I guided my neighbor. We went down to Concord Mills and we watched the red shoulder hawk. All of a sudden he jumped down and he came back with this snake in his mouth. I've since learned that red shoulder hawks are very fond of snakes. Next slide, please. This is the green jay, which looks like it should be somewhere in Costa Rica. It was on a trip to uh, the Rio Grande area of Texas back in February of this year. Next slide. This is a particularly terrible picture, but a very picture that I'm very fond of. I was went out in the Everglades of Florida looking for a smooth billed Ani. I saw what I thought was a boat tailed grackle. I took a picture when I got home on Friday, I enlarged it and lo and behold, I got the smooth build on it. <laughs> next, next picture. This is uh, one of my favorite pictures. Um, this is the only endemic in Florida. It's the Florida scrub jay. It's got a total of five acorns in its mouth. Two in the three, two in the gullet, three in the bill. These are very gregarious birds, very habitat specific, and this is just happens to be one of the best, the luckiest photos I got of the entire year. Beautiful. I went on the same trip that John Hanna and Chris Hanna went to uh, South Africa. We spent thirty days. 
by my count, we got 471 species. Um, this is an orange breasted sunbird on a prolia bush. It's a very dry, arid, rocky environment, but yet you have these fab fantastically beautiful plants with these fantastically beautiful birds. It is also endemic. Okay, but how many how many birds did you end up for the year? Well, or I you didn't still want can't. To you ask. Uh, I finished with 526 birds in my first full year of birding in the United States, which put me at number 77 on the eBird Top 100. Yay! I 955 worldwide. And I'm even more impressed that that put me at number nine, uh, 585 worldwide for 2022. Good. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. I did not add. I did not add 500. <laughs> to my list this year, but I have a, a handful of life birds that I added. Um, this is just a picture that I liked from this year. Um, we had uh, Mick Audubon had a trip out uh, to the coast, and on the way, we did this tiny little detour to get a rare gull. In um, as many birders know, the nastiest places often make the best birding spots. So um, we were at a landfill in uh, South Carolina looking for this one gull. So which one of these birds does not look like the other? And imagine this about, I don't know how many, what, 20 times is this amount? I don't know how many, but, but um, a few of us were out there looking for it. And you can show the next slide. This is our bird. The slatyback gull, normally Pan Asian, Alaska area, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so I just like this picture because of the whole dump and the truck in the back. It's just kind of <laughs> iconic, explaining where we were. Um, next, okay. So this is um, not bird, but it, it does lead into my next uh, photographs. Uh, so some of you know, I finally got married in June. It, and this is kind of what a wedding looks like after. This is what a wedding looks like after five COVID delays and various iterations. You just go where you want to have a honeymoon and go up by yourself. I really like the bottle. <laughs> it was a good time. So Santa Fe was beautiful. We did Santa Fe and Taos and a big queue. We did a, like a little circular, not a lot of driving, but beautiful area and various habitats. Um, so I had uh, just three life birds when I was there because I have traveled some areas near there, but never specifically in New Mexico. So this is a juniper titmouse, um, pretty much a very dull overall gray titmouse, but cute and gregarious. So. Um, this one I was thrilled about. I did not even know this bird was going to be there. We went up to the uh, Taros ski area. It was off season. This was June. I didn't realize it was such a tiny little area, if anyone's ever been up there. Um, but apparently it is the uh, habitat for the McGillicris. So uh, I saw two there and I just knew I had a different warbler, but it took me a minute to even realize because this wasn't a birding trip per se. So I wasn't really prepared, but very thrilled to see it. See it. And the mountain bluebird. So this was in the Ghost Ranch, where um, that's in the Ibicu area, which is a little bit um, west of Taos and Santa Fe. Beautiful desert area, but um, this is where Georgia O'Keeffe does did all her painting. And uh, so I got to watch a family of mountain bluebirds tending to their young and in and out of their nest and stuff. So it was cool. And that's it. Happy New Year.
everybody. Happy yeah. New Year. After a two year hiatus, I finally started traveling internationally again, as did a lot of people in this past year. I normally travel to follow my number one passion, which is diving and underwater photography. But there's a huge overlap, as I have discovered, between good diving places and good birding places. So I just wanted to show a small sampling of a half dozen birds that I came across during my travels. Um, in January, I traveled to Baja, California, to Cabo San Lucas for a few days of whale watching around Cabo and to go diving in the Socorro Islands, which are about 200 miles south of Cabo. But um, I did a little birding along the way, and this was a little Gila woodpecker that I came across in Cabo. In March, I was lucky enough to visit my sister and brother-in-law in Curacao, where I had never been before. And I wanted to show you a couple of uh, different birds from there. These are uh, brown-throated parakeets. I believe they're also called Caribbean parakeets. And there are slight variations on the theme depending upon which of the ABC islands you go to, Aruba, Bonaire, Curacao, they're all a little different. Of course, the ones in Curacao are the prettiest ones. <laughs> um, this is also in Curacao, beautiful bird, which is actually the national bird of Curacao, uh, has a beautiful song as well. And I'm um, a, um, uh, a brain dead birder when it comes to sounds but this bird was particularly beautiful. Interestingly, um, despite the fact that it's the national bird of Curacao, um, eBird um, lists it as the Venezuelan trupial. The Curacaoans, I believe, refer to it just as trupial. There's a couple of different, a uh, couple of additional species of uh, trupial that um, th whose ranges are uh, further south in South America. And then this past fall, uh, end of September into October, I traveled to the Solomon Islands to go diving um, via uh, Nandi in Fiji and Brisbane, Australia. I spent a total of about four days in Brisbane and did some birding around Brisbane. And this is actually a shot of um, a sacred kingfisher taken from a boat. Uh, we took a little uh, boat ride up the Brisbane River um, it's a river that runs through Brisbane and then go, continues on inland. Next, please. Um, also, Brisbane, um, there's, there are some wetlands around the port of Brisbane, and actually some really nice birds there as well. And this little guy I thought was kind of interesting looking. He's actually a little bit more colorful uh, than this image is portraying in his wings. It's a crested pigeon that was just sitting in a tree by the wetlands there. And finally, out to the Solomon Islands, this is a small island with very good diving called Mary Island. And in between dives off the stern of the boat, I did some birding, uh, hornbills, parrots, parakeets, et cetera, et cetera. And there was a uh, Brahmini kite that was um, hunting around uh, there, kind of a cool looking raptor. I'm very partial to raptors. I just thought you had to get a raptor. Yeah. Does he use the same camera for now? He went down to bird. Does it? Ask him later. That's, that's not a bird. <laughs> that's not a bird question. <laughs> I did some traveling this year too, but this was all local birds. Matter of fact, I think the first one is right outside my window. Yeah. We had a, a nice little snow in Charlotte in the middle of January last year. And uh, we have got a dogwood tree on the corner of the house. And last year we had, uh, we counted five males at one time and four females at oh. one time. We started seeing them a few years ago when we put out some butter bark bits from the natural, am I okay? You just have a small oh, soft, soft voice. Yeah. You just need to be close to the mic. And so then we started putting out the, the cheap grape jelly. Uh, they're still coming. We got quite a few of this year too, but no snow yet. So. Um, Six Mile Creek Greenway. This was in um, 
I think this was in February last year. It was sort of a mild day in, and I went down there and and uh, found this black and white. I'm pretty sure this was on Mother's Day. We went to uh, Clark's Creek hoping to see the um, um, the migratory birds, the um, what you call it, the bobolinks, which we did. And uh, so in the go running down in the whatever, whatever I'm not a naturalist botanist, not sure what the purple is, but fetch. Uh, Latta Park. Actually, it was just sitting, kind of resting a little bit on that bench, sort of toward the road. And all of a sudden, this little bird showed up underneath the bushes, and it was a worm eating warbler. <laughs> Oh, I don't think worm eating warblers really eat worth that many worms, do they? Well, caterpillar worms. <laughs> yeah, caterpillar worms. So. Uh, this was on a trip to Congaree with the Audubon. Um, it was a one day trip. We went to Congaree with Ron Clark leading. And there were several affiliated woodpeckers that were down having a good time on this rotten wood down on the floor of the Congaree. Oh, this was at uh, Yates Mill. Talk about birds coming up to you. you the Phoebe, which we know are very friendly. This little bird came and just landed right on the railing. Yeah, there's a kind of a, a walkway over uh, a marshy area at Ye Ye Yatesville Park in Raleigh. And I don't know, he was, I guess uh, other people come out there and attract him and talk to him. And so when we showed up, he just came and talked back, so. And uh, this is at Water Rock Knob uh, on the Blue Ridge Parkway between Blowing Rock and uh, Waynesville in uh, August or July. No, I think it was in July. Went to my mom's birthday and on our way back, we stopped up there. Another very friendly warbler. I think that's it, isn't it? Like several people, I did some traveling this year, but these are all local birds. Uh, this was down in Florida at uh, Green Cay Wetlands in April of this year. And this uh, the red winged blackbirds are setting up territories of green. So we have him okay. and her. This red shouldered hawk was by a little pond by my house. I'm going to focus this a little bit. Okay. This red shoulder hawk is just going to land on the mirror house. I want you to know that we have at least three red shoulder hawks in this. People, people like red shoulder hawks. They're, as we say, friendly, right? Street, yes. <laughs> Very friendly. Uh, this was back in Palm Beach County, Florida, uh, Purple Gallagher, who was walking across the penny grass. Yeah, two palm warblers. I think this one was taken in Florida, and that's the yellow variety. And the next one should be the western variety, and they look very different. And the yellow ones breed in the far north and the east, and the western ones breed in the west. West. <laughs> They're usually here in the west. <laughs> yeah, they, they pass through and yeah. some hang around the wind. Is that anyone? Yeah, that's it. Um, hi, everybody. Um, so I was making up for lost time traveling this year. <laughs> Am I close enough to? Okay. Um, 
So here are a few pictures from the past year. This one is a booted racket tail hummingbird um, from Ecuador. I was in Ecuador in March for two weeks, and this is in the Bindo area. Um, if any of you, those of you who have been to Ecuador know the, the hummingbirds vary dramatically, or all the birds really vary dramatically, depending on whether you're on the east side or the west side uh, of the Andes. And um, so these guys show up just in this one little area in the, the Mindo area. This was my uh, favorite bird of the trip um, to Ecuador. Paradise Tanger. So we were in the Amazon Ski Lodge, and this was a day trip we took where you walked up this huge tower called the Napo Tower. It's on uh, some indigenous land, and it's really cool because you're up there with all these like big trees right next to you. And so this bird was, you know, way, way, way high up in the tree, but I was eye level with him because we were in this tower. And um, so we got really lucky with a lot of gorgeous tanagers showing up that day. Speak to us. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I just like looking at him. <laughs> um, so this is the Harlequin duck um, in, from Iceland. We were in Iceland in May and um, you know, I have seen them from a huge distance uh, out <laughs> uh, on the coast uh, in North Carolina in the winter, and they don't look anything like that. <laughs> uh, so it was a real treat to see one um, in their gorgeous plumage close up. Um, no, because it was light almost 24 hours a day when we were there. Yep, it got dark for just a couple hours a day. <laughs> Um, so this is now uh, where we're living in France. Um, there's uh, farm fields that are uh, right near where we live. We're able to do like this little loop. And this is a red-legged partridge. And it's kind of funny because you know, I think we all go out birding with an intent in mind to see a particular bird or hoping to see a particular bird or groups of birds. And so I had my mind on ducks that morning and I was buzzing along the road past the farm fields and I turn and the sun is shining on this, this field and I look and I see four of these partridges just next to the road in the farm field. And I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> so of course I pulled over, rolled down the window, got my camera out and, uh, and took a quick picture before they realized somebody was looking at them and then they flew off of course. But you just never know what you're gonna see when you, when you aren't expecting it. You know, it just makes you remember to, to keep your eyes open all the time. Um, this bird is just crazy gorgeous, uh, a, a violet back starling from Kruger Park. I was in Kruger in November and they really do look actually, they look better than that even. They look better than that even when the sun's shining on them. This is kind of like, you know, overcast day. They are just crazy purple. And this was my favorite bird maybe of the year, it's hard to decide, but certainly of my trip to South Africa, um, like John, the lilac um, breasted roller is just such a gorgeous bird. And uh, this guy, we saw them again and again. I mean, they're almost a trash bird in, in South Africa, believe it or not. <laughs> and, uh, but they're just so colorful. And this guy was right next to the road. And as you can see, kind of putting on a show and really just not, not at all bothered by us. <laughs> Oh, you're going to be Joe? Are you Joe? Joe Ponce is not here, but he's given me his proxy. Okay. And so I have no clue what's going to show up. So let's see. Oh, they're gorgeous. I'll tell you that. That's it. This I've bald eagle. 
I really want to know whether this is actually in black and white or. or it looks like it's kind of processed in black yeah, and white. Black, it's, it's a gorgeous picture. Love it. <laughs> Look at the veins in there. The white pelicans are going to be coming back to the Adkin River any time now. So. Yeah, I was going to say, you have to tell us. Yeah, I'll, I'll let you know. Oh, fish that. What kind of fish is that? It's like a brim. Oh, no, it looks like a crappie. That's fine. What kind of fish? I think it's a crappie. <laughs> Joe went to Columbia this summer and. Crimson rump to connect. Long distance. <laughs> Joe went to Africa this summer. <laughs> that might be a line. Yeah, that might be a line. That's I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Secretary Bird. Be some birds. He's got all of it. Okay. Okay, I'm try I'm going to try not to do what everybody else is doing. Okay, go ahead next. Okay, so the first picture is that this is an osprey, obviously. Uh, uh, it was taken, uh, Gretchen was on this trip uh, when we were in Texas. Uh, actually, it was really in 21, but I just love this picture. Uh, he was He was really close and I have actually a series of him moving across and this is the one I put in. Okay, next. We're on the boat. We're on the boat, on the boat. Um, the other place, this is uh, the Lubel, Lu Leona Bell Turnboil, Turnbull Bird Center. Okay, and it, I mean, we could have stayed there Three or four days. I mean, it was the, the the birds were just so cooperative. They were so close. I mean, you could, and the water was so clear. You can see under, you know, the thing. I actually have one of of the of, of the of the pie bell grebe actually swimming underwater. The water was so close, and we we're right above the birds, looking straight down on them. It was wonderful. Uh, it was hard to leave that place. Ron had to, you know, pull us away. Okay, okay, now. Gretchen will also appreciate this one because we put this in to our eBird. Uh, she took pictures of this, and the next thing you know, we get a little message back and said, uh, "We put it in as a uh, snowy egret or a red, yeah. Yeah, snowy egret." And we get <laughs> this is actually a reddish egret in the um, white face. And again, he was just showing off. I you know, have all kinds of pictures of various. Uh, uh, poses and stuff, but he was enjoying. They were all over taking baths, which is what made it so nice to be there. Okay, next, next. Okay, so then after going to Texas uh, in January, Lucy and I went to um, Minnesota in January. Um, I want you to know it's probably about 20 degrees, 20 below when I took this picture. I was amazed that the cameras actually worked. Uh, but after being in um, in, in Zach Zim, uh, I decided that this was now my favorite bird. Um, the, the uh, well, oh, this, I said hoary red pole. That's not a hoary red pole. pole that's a, a common red pole. I'm sorry, that's, that's wrong. <laughs> um, but anyway, they have such a little attitude. And of course, if you're out there and 20 below, you have to have an attitude. <laughs> um, but they are, they're not much bigger than a you know, regular uh, finch. Uh, but just, just adorable and just very, you know, lots of personality. All right. This is also a Zach Zim. And the reason I put this in, turkeys are turkeys, right? Actually, they do have, there are five different kinds. There are five subspecies of turkeys and they have a different one up there. I have a picture of one of the regular ones, which is weird, really weird thing coming out of the top of their head. But these are called ghost turkeys because they are part of this subspecies that are basically white. Um, and you would think that they, they, they blend in well if they're out there in, in the snow by themselves. Uh, and this was at um, Mary, Mary Lou's, right. Uh, and again, probably in about 
20, maybe, maybe it had gotten to 15 degrees by then, right? Uh, I mean, 15 below, uh, it was stuck. I think that might be the last one. Oh no. So then <laughs> I got tired of the cold. We went to Panama as a group and this is just one of the, the trogans that I needed to put in. This is one of my favorite, uh, the garter trogan and that's it. Okay. You want to say, Steve? You want to close up the meeting? Yeah, just flip the switches. Well, thanks everyone who submitted photos and thanks everyone for coming out. Thanks for bringing the great food. It's been a really nice evening. And uh, next month, we're going to hear about the NC Bird Atlas. So, hope to see you then. Thank you. Oh, David, you saved my life. It's hard to do.